Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Bhagam Radian here at the Air Force Association's annual Air Space Cyber Conference and Trade Show outside Washington, D.C., the number one gathering of U.S. Air Force leaders from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Harris and Leonardo DRS, and it's our positive honor uh, to have with us the United States Air Force General Cobra Harigian, uh, who is uh, the commander of the U.S. Air Forces uh, Europe and Africa. Sir, thanks very much for all the time. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for uh, having an opportunity to chat with you. Uh, it's a pleasure. I uh, was at the uh, media availability that you had earlier in the day, and that was uh, very interesting, as, as always. Um, I want to start with uh, the Russian threat, something that uh, occupies your attention. Obviously, some Russian activity up in the high north now with the S-400 battery that Moscow uh, has just deployed there. Um, how, do you, how do you assess the Russian threat? Because there's a big debate on that. The Russians obviously are trying to inflate what they look like. Uh, a lot of academics, we talked to uh, uh, Robert Dalshow of uh, the Swedish Institute for uh, the, the Swedish uh, Defense Research uh, Institute, you know, and he said, look, you know, the, the Russians are big on talking about capabilities, but the real capabilities are somewhat less. How do you assess the threat on what the Russians can actually do and what they can't do, and how does that shape how you think about, you, you and our allies are thinking about uh, the theater and how best to maintain deterrence? Well, as you know, I was fortunate to spend two years dealing with them while I was operating and absent. And it gave me great insight into how they maximize what is, frankly, scarce resources generally. And so that concept has continued as I've, as I've watched their operations across Europe. They're able to take packages of capability, demonstrate what they have, combine it with a narrative that we have been very cognizant of, and I think that gives us great insight to understanding what their true capabilities are. Now, having said that, they are developing some advanced capabilities with precision that we need to be cognizant of and to develop not only proactive manners, but also reactive manners to make sure that we're properly postured. Um, do you, as, as you look at um, the Arctic, um, that's a theater that you've been talking a lot about, Charlie Brown, uh, General Brown, the uh, commander of Pacific Air Forces, uh, has been talking a little bit about Antarctica and the challenges uh, that, that might be there, but also in the high north as well, since his part of the world mm -hmm. goes you know, all the way from the top, all the way to the very bottom as well. Um, what is the S-400 deployment uh, to the high north? Is, is it on, it's on Russian territory now, so is, where is it, in Novoye Zimlia or? Yes, it's, it's right up in that area. You probably said it closer than I could pronounce it specifically. But importantly, we've watched that build up. We're managing the, our resources to appropriately get the indications and warnings we need so that we can respond if required. It's clear though that uh, this is not an area that um, we're consistently worried about trying to penetrate because we know we can if we have to. And at the end of the day, it's ensuring that we have freedom of navigation, freedom of maneuver, particularly as it supports our far northern partners our Norwegian partners as they operate up in that vicinity up there. Uh, speaking about the vicinity, uh, uh, there was a uh, explosion of some nuclear uh, gadget. Um, you know, a little bit of the reporting has been that it was some, some Russian doomsday weapon. Uh, I spoke to a prominent Russian analyst who said it was it was more either a battery for a deep space probe or a deep space propulsion engine, uh, and then countered the Russian narrative that there are nuclear pr propelled weapons and things like that. From your understanding. What kind of a system was that that exploded that did cause the spike in radiation well, originally? It, it looked to us like there was some type of a, a weapon system that they were trying to recover there. Uh, I don't have all the specifics, but clearly there was a narrative that the Russians were communicating that I believe many of us, as we've dug into the details, understood it to be a narrative where they were looking to cover up exactly what had specifically happened. Right, uh, but are there um, like nuclear propelled weapons and things like that that you're concerned about? Because if you talk to many academics, they look at some of that stuff and they go, well, it's, there are a whole bunch of practical issues why that's difficult. Are you treating some of these reports uh, seriously in terms of some of the Russian capability that's under development according to what they say? Well, we're always taking in every and anyone's data to take a harder look at what they're actually uh, being in development right now. And uh, with each and every one of those, we take a hard look to determine the viability, potentially what they could do, we all know they have nuclear weapons, and we know their thoughts with respect to how they would operate with those particular weapons. So for us, that's something we're always watching. We've always got our eye on that and looking for ways to ensure that we don't drive ourselves in any situation that would potentially drive escalation. Um, everybody keeps talking about any access area denial bubbles. You operated, as you mentioned, in very close proximity to S-400. 
uh, it's now in, in the high north, but it's also in Kaliningrad and a lot of other places. As, as you look at penetrating the A280 bubble, how confident are you that uh, you know, U.S. and allied forces would be able to handle any eventuality in the theater? First off, I'll tell you, I'm very confident. And as Gerald Goldfein highlighted this morning, we don't look at it as a bubble, it's switch cheese. Our capabilities allow us to ensure that we understand as we combine both non-kinetic and kinetic effects, how we're gonna be able to get in there, protect our force, or if required, degrade and potentially destroy any of those air defenses that would uh, be in the, in the way of executing our mission set. Uh, Gonzo Gunzinger, who's uh, one of the sharp minds at the uh, Mitchell Institute, uh, has been talking about uh, um, that the best way to deter or, or to get on the step of an anti-access uh, anti area denial region is to have as many forward forces as possible. Do you have enough assets, uh, whether planes or aircraft in Europe, in order to serve as that sort of front uh, deterrent edge? So this resources, our forces, is something that we're consistently looking at. And we're always working through how we leverage not only U.S. assets, but also our partners, assuming that we will be fighting in a coalition. So there's a, a certain capacity that we have to have forward, also recognizing we're gonna bring forces in from the states given the readiness that we've been able to achieve. So I think when you combine all those, we're in a pretty good position to be able to deliver, um, deter, and win if required. Um, obviously, uh, actual uh, combat uh, employment is the name of the game. Uh, the chief has been talking a lot about that, about increasingly distributed operations, uh, much more smaller units moving around all the time. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that the other guy doesn't have a chance to uh, smack any of our planes that are in big formations. But the challenge, and, and I know the checkered flag did this, uh, right, because each one of these mobile units uh, have to be supported during the Cold War under checkered flag. We did that a lot in terms of moving it. But we're also going to have to move the logistical hubs while the units are moving. What are some of the challenges that that presents? Because it's a little bit like the Cold War uh, when you started in this game, mm -hmm. but it's also different. Right, clearly uh, highly contested. It'll be an area that frankly, the, the criticality of developing partnerships and working with partners that will help facilitate some of this because we can't do it all by ourselves. And so developing those relationships doing training and exercising together is where we're gonna make our money as we continue to learn how to optimize what our partners bring and what we bring to that capability. Um, when you, uh, from a resupply standpoint though, right, during the Cold War, each of the military services worked to neck down as much as possible the logistical supply lines, right? We, we went to NATO standard caliber ammunition to make life easier for us so that we weren't at a different ammunition caliber than all of our allies were. How do we, do, do we need to do a similar kind of necking down for the future, given that the last 20 years, you know, we had transportation dominance, we had airspace dominance, whereas now there are going to be a lot of lives tied to each pound of cargo, and mm -hmm. if you can avoid shipping it, you may want to avoid shipping it. Do we need to think about requirements, supply lines, supply trains, and supportability in a different way? Well, we're always thinking about how we get those required capabilities to the front edge of the fight. And often we're gonna to have to find the right balance between how close we need to be and, and what that supply line would look like. But I will tell you, in and amongst all this is what we've been able to do with F-35s. And the interoperability, as we demonstrated this summer, demonstrates that you can leverage your partners to help with some of those problem sets. So while we try to shorten, we also realize that we don't want to shorten it too much because we need to have a targeting problem that is presented to the Russians. Right. Um, you know, you mentioned F-35, and I wanted to, uh, this is not on my list, but you triggered a uh, question. It's, it's a really incredible time in Europe in terms of combat aircraft development programs. France, Germany, Spain together on one uh, very ambitious, low observable family approach system. You have Team Tempest that now includes Sweden, Italy, and led by the United Kingdom. Uh, that is looking to develop its own cutting edge set of suite of capabilities. Uh, you've got Sweden independently fielding the new version of the Gripen, of course. Uh, how, what role do you think you can play or are playing in making sure that all of the systems that come into service are ultimately as interoperable as possible, given that, you know, as you've told me before, the individual national platform is, is less important than the fact that everybody can play together. Right. Mm -hmm. I would tell you that the, uh, the best part of this discussion is all these allies and partners understand the importance of interoperability. So it may not be the same sensors per se, but if we're sharing information across our platforms in a manner that allows us to have a shared understanding of the environment, 
I'm not concerned about what weapon they're shooting. As long as we're working together and are sharing that data, that will be key to our success. And I would offer to you that our partners and allies, they understand that. Um, from a cyber perspective, um, you know, Chinese uh, uh, operations are sort of pervasive. We've heard about the Huawei communication gear and the potential security mm -hmm. issue that that provides in, in, in Europe. You combine that also with espionage. And, and you mentioned that in your uh, opening remarks about, you know, the fact that China is actually a player in the European theater uh, and certainly in Africa uh, as well. Well, how, what's the best way to think about cyber and how are you inculcating a, a cyber war fighting spirit in your force given that information, disinformation, all of these pieces are, is, are intimately critical to the outcome of, of campaign operations, mm -hmm. especially with an adversary that is highly adversaries that are highly uh, aggressive in the information and cyber domain to exploit, to shape, and even, even to strike. It starts with the culture inside our force. Helping our young airmen understand the importance of protecting our network properly taking care of the way they operate on the network, that, that's job one. I think the other important part that we've taken a step forward on is, de is developing defense teams that are zeroed in at the base level at defending our network. So while we do that inside our base with our weapon systems, this has got to be a culture that pervades our force. And we've made great steps, but clearly there's a lot of work to be done here because as you highlight, the enemy is adapting all the time. Um, INF, uh, Intermediate uh, Range Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty has been dissolved. Russia was a clear violator. Uh, so even uh, allies who would rather have seen that treaty not go away appreciate and understand uh, the need to do that. Um, what are the potential challenges this raises? Because obviously Russia has been preparing um, a number of different weapon systems, uh, which is the reason the treaty was abrogated. Uh, but also what opportunities does that give us at a time when we're trying to um, you know, develop longer sticks with which to hit uh, a number of our potential adversaries. So as you highlight, while it's clear that they've been violating for, for long periods of time, as Secretary Esper has said, we're going to go out and work on our capabilities to ensure we have not only an offensive capability, but also the capability to defend ourselves, which is something that we're consistently working on in terms of, as the Chief highlighted, our integrated base defense will be a priority going forward to move quickly on how we not only have that offensive capability that we're developing with hypersonics, but also to ensure we can defend our force, particularly for a place in Europe where, where we're well inside the threat ring. Are, are you uh, concerned about hypersonic weapons? I mean, is that something that is more theoretical or, in, from your standpoint, actually a lot more practical, realistic? And if so, what's the timeline before which you're really facing those timelines? Well, they're coming. And we have to face that. And I think the planning going into how we defend ourselves is something we need to be doing right now while we simultaneously build our own capabilities. To put a timeline on it would be very difficult because we can never cons specifically develop what those timelines are going to be. So I think from the warfighter where I sit right now, we need to be thinking how we're going to best defend ourselves while we develop plans that provide us that offensive capability. Um, there's a concern that some have, though, that um, you know, air and missile defenses are now the purview of the Army and the Navy, which provide that to the Air Force as necessary, whether from sea or from, from land. And there's a little bit of a concern whether uh, they're going to be so busy defending their core forces that their role in projecting uh, that cover for air bases, especially air bases on the move, is going to be something that's a little more difficult. At, at some point, do you need different con ops or consider acquisition of your own missile defense systems to protect your forward air bases, especially when you're on the move? As an Air Force, right now, we're thinking through, as we look at agile combat employment, what would be the level required to ensure, for, particularly for our, our smaller packages of capabilities, that would be required to defend themselves? And when we think about that, that's everything from a counter small UAS capability to end game some inter integrated air missile defense, which I would think of more along the lines of a, of a broader defense as opposed to a point defense. So there's probably a mix there across the services that we're going to need to sort out as we develop this concept of operation. Uh, two more questions. Uh, Saudi Arabia was on the receiving end of an attack, precision drones being, uh, you know, which, which I think people foresaw that even small drones equipped with explosives can become precision weapons that could have very, very, very uh, serious implications. Uh, we saw some of these uh, employed against American and allied forces in Iraq mm -hmm. as well as in Afghanistan. Um, how are you, what's the, how do you see the threat and how are you 
uh, positioning and developing and fueling capability and technology to protect bases because this is kind of a, a poor man's precision weapon with strategic mm -hmm. effects. So as you know, I have a fair amount of experience dealing with this as the beginnings of it occurred back when we were uh, operating in Iraq and Syria. So I think the key starts with domain awareness and having appropriate sensors, and this is thinking beyond just radars, but any capability that would give us awareness that a threat like that was out there, whether it be a, a small drone just outside your fence or a longer range capability. So it truly is this integrated layered defense that we have to f think our way through. And I believe, at least from my perspective, we got to kind of start inside out and use an approach that layers in, fuses information to allow us to defend ourselves while we then integrate it to a broader integrated air and missile defense construct. Um, uh, last question. Um, the president in announcing a border wall emergency and ordering the defense secretary to redirect unobligated uh, military construction funds, um, some of that resources came from Europe. Uh, I know that some of that was important, some of it is also long term. It's it's a little bit further out there. Obviously, um, Secretary Esper has said, look, you know, this is important. The president wants to build a border wall and we're going to make that funding available. Um, the defense secretary uh, also went to Europe and said, hey, European nations can pony up uh, for some of that military construction funding. From your standpoint, what are what's the impact of this? Because that investment was part of the European uh, de deterrence uh, defense. Uh, I don't. I can't. I can't even reassurance. I can't even remember. Is it de European de defense deterrence initiative. No, right, it's the deterrence initiative. Correct. I was uh, having a little bit of a vacuum there. Um, what's the impact of these cuts in your real world ability to deliver capability, deter, uh, deliver deterrence? And what are the conversations you've had with some of your fellow airmen uh, in terms of uh, some of our European partners uh, picking up the tab? for stuff that they didn't expect to be picking up the tab with, right? I think folks don't necessarily have a problem with that, but I think that some folks are maybe struggling with the timing. So right now, the short-term impl implications are very minimal. We've been able to work our way through that based on where these particular structures were in terms of the funding and when that was gonna occur. More broadly though, the partners are very interested in interoperability and communicating how we work together to deliver deterrence is what this is really all about. So this will be an ongoing conversation that we need to have with them. I think over time we'll find that as we pull together and sort out where we are as the, as the U.S. and where they need to be, will be a conversation that will work together and ultimately ensure that we can compete, deter, and win if we have to go at this together. Um, I, I'm sorry, let me ask you one quick question on Africa, because we're going to talk to General Kaczynski, who's the logistics mm -hmm. chief uh, down there in a very, very tough logistical theater, and thank God we've got allies like the French there, who are uh, you know, certainly one of our closest partners. Um, Talk to us about operations in Africa, how important they are. You know, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, but there's so much important stuff that's going on there uh, on our own, but also with our French allies, but also a number of African allies. You were just mm -hmm. in Africa. Uh, you know, talk to us a little bit about the importance of that mission and how much of your bandwidth uh, is devoted there, because there too, it's a battlefront in a cold, uh, you know, great power competition where China is in there trying to get as much advantage as it can as well. Right, as you highlight, first off, it's, it's a massive continent. And frankly, from uh, you know a Department of Defense perspective, air provides the agility that we need down there. Job one, of course, for me is ensuring that we're appropriately protecting our troops on the ground and that we're, we're latched with them, providing that overwatch, uh, as some areas clearly have some terrorism activities, that they are doing great work to ensure that we know where they are and when we can, we take care of business there. As you highlight, though, more broadly, there is also global power competition occurring across Africa. So as we look at that, it's identifying those areas where we can get the, the investment in our partners. And I would tell you that largely starts as we, as we train with them, spend time with them, identifying those individuals that we can invest time in, that they will become partners with us in the long term to help us compete with the Chinese, who ultimately are acting in nefarious ways, not delivering in the long term, and leveraging our relationships and who we are as an Americans is gonna help us compete down there. General uh, Jeff Cobra Harigian, uh, the commander of U.S. Air Forces uh, in Europe, as well as U.S. Air Forces Africa. Sir, uh, thanks very much, really appreciate it, and, and still looking forward to seeing you over in uh, sunny Europe, uh, hopefully uh, sooner than later. Thanks Sounds so much. Good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you. Thank you.